Welcome to part 3 of lecture 2 of Wolf Body Aerodynamics. So let's again discuss this interpretation of Reynolds number. What the Reynolds number really is, is it re it's a number that represents the impact of viscous forces on the flow relative to those of inertial effects. So we can think of 1 over the Reynolds number as how close do I have to be to a solid wall to notice viscous effects? And if we want to get a sense of what kind of a reasonable Reynolds number would be, for air, um, the kinematic viscosity at standard conditions is about 1.5 times 10 to the minus 5 meters squared per second. So the Reynolds number for cars tends to be pretty large, right? The length scale is a uh, few meters. The velocity scales can be, you know, up to, you know, in the vicinity of 100 kilometers an hour. So you're talking Reynolds numbers in the range of, you know, 10, uh, 100,000 to, to 10 million or 100 million even. And that means that the inertial forces are, you know, millions of times more dominant than the viscous effects throughout most of the flow field. So if we look at our non-dimensional Navier-Stokes equations, it seems like the Reynolds number is the only innate parameter that appears for steady and compressible flow. But how, how can we be sure? Well, if we use dimensional analysis, this lets us identify the true parameters uh, that are the number of true parameters that are needed to describe a physical situation. And this is explained through the Buckingham Pi theorem, where we have m independent variables, n dimensions or types of units, and if in that case, the number of non-dimensional groups will be at least m minus n. So for external aerodynamics, we can do our Buckingham Pi setup. So first, you need to list and count the independent variables. Recall that the density and the viscosity are actually separate parameters. List and count the dimensions, and then determine the number of independent non-dimensional groups. So we've got five variables, the net force on our object, the incoming velocity u infinity, the length scale l, the density rho, and the viscosity mu. And we have three dimensions, mass, length, and time. Right? I can just look at v velocity and density, and between those two quantities, I cover those three types of units. No other types of units are introduced. Force is, of course, can be expressed in terms of mass, length, and time. So therefore, we have 5 minus 3 equals 2 non-dimensional parameters. Now, the theorem doesn't tell us anything about what the form of those parameters should be. One we've now got, Reynolds number. The other is what we call a force coefficient. Basically, the force coefficient non-dimensionalizes the net force. Right, a force is a pressure times an area, so we would expect the net force on the body should be able to be non-dimensionalized with respect to a quantity that has pressure units and then also some area. Now the obvious area would be L squared, um, but in practice for cars, the frontal area, which we dub A sub S, is normally used for, for cars and other bluff bodies. The choice of reference area is, at the end of the day, arbitrary. As long as you know what it is, you can convert to a, a different form of the force coefficient that uses a different reference area without any difficulty. For pressure, the non-dimensionalizing scale is the dynamic pressure, since the pressure level does not matter in incompressible flow. So in this case, then, the force coefficient Cf is the net force over 1 half rho u infinity squared times Af. So the Buckingham Pi theorem allows us to relate these two parameters. Since the force coefficient and the Reynolds number are the only non-dimensional parameters in a steady, incompressible flow, for a given geometry, it must be the case that the force coefficient is purely a function of Reynolds number. Now we can resolve that force coefficient into components, for example, lift and drag coefficients, CL and CD, and each of those will depend only on Reynolds number for a given geometry. 
the local pressure distribution you know, throughout the entire flow field can also be non-dimensionalized. When we were talking about potential flow, we introduced the pressure coefficient, Cp, which is P minus P infinity over that uh, reference dynamic pressure. Now we can't write this in terms of just velocities anymore because in general in a viscous flow our total or stagnation pressure is not constant everywhere anymore. So, but, but we can always use this definition of pressure coefficient that is actually based on the pressure fields. So now that we've sort of established our relevant non-dimensional parameters, we can return to scale model testing. So we can answer our earlier question. How to know what the flow conditions for the scale model are that in some, are in some way equivalent to those for a full scale vehicle? And the answer, of course, is that the non-dimensional parameters must be maintained to be constant. Unfortunately, that's easier said than done in practice. And the reason is we need to make sure that our flow assumptions are maintained. So we've assumed incompressible flow, but this requires that the free stream Mach number, uh, which is the velocity divided by the speed of sound, is less than about 0.2. Now, if we go to a scale model that's smaller than our real thing, it, we're going to require for constant kinematic viscosity an equal scale up in the velocity in order to match the Reynolds number. So for example, if we had a one-fifth scale model, we'd need five times the velocity. So it's really easy to get to velocities where the Mach number is greater than 0.2 and then the flow is no longer incompressible and our entire basis for our dimensional analysis breaks down. So how do we overcome these flow compressibility challenges? We need to maintain the flow in the incompressible regime. Ideally, we want to maintain the Reynolds number too. So there's two types of solutions here. The first is cryogenic and or pressurized wind tunnels. These operate at low temperatures or and or high pressures um, where to achieve significantly higher density and therefore reduce the need for very high velocities. The other approach is to use incident turbulence to make a lower Reynolds number flow effectively behave like a higher Reynolds number one. In addition, we don't necessarily always need to match the Reynolds number exactly because the variation of drag coefficient, which is normally the thing we would care about measuring the most in a wind tunnel for a bluff body like a car, um, that variation stops being significant once the Reynolds number gets high enough. So we see that here in this plot that the uh, drag coefficient becomes very close to flat as we go to very high Reynolds numbers. So if the vehicle operates at you know uh, 10 to the to the 7 Reynolds number, if you know we had a Reynolds number of of maybe about half of that, you know five times 10 to the 6, the drag coefficient is maybe only going to be about one or two percent different. So this lack of sensitivity means that we don't have to match the non-dimensional conditions exactly. Now this occurs for most shapes, but not all. Uh, sometimes the sensitivity can be greater than you might expect. So presently the way we would determine this is using computational fluid dynamics um, to simulate the flow at different Reynolds numbers and from there um, even though the drag coefficient is predicted we typically don't expect to be exactly right but we would be able to see if there's a sensitivity to Reynolds number and that would allow us to determine what we could get away with in terms of a wind tunnel test. And if the Reynolds number can't be made high enough, we need to add turbulence. Um, so the main concern if the, if the Reynolds numbers are mismatched in the scale model test is that the transition from laminar to turbul turbulent flow within the boundary layers, which is something we'll discuss later today, um, will, will happen at the wrong place. At very high Reynolds numbers, that transition tends to happen almost immediately um, for all but the very smoothest of shapes. And so the solution at the lower Reynolds number you might need in a wind tunnel is to use screens or, or other sort of blockages in the flow to generate high turbulence before the flow gets to the car. So this tends to cause the boundary layers to become fully turbulent quite early and it mimics but does not exactly match 
the effect of higher Reynolds number on the drag coefficient.